Hi everyone, I'm Diego Martinez and this is Tunes, a podcast about the songs we vibe to. This podcast is dedicated to the history and longevity of underrated and much-loved tunes, featuring exclusive interviews with the people at the very heart of the creative process. It's time to put on our new shoes, because on this episode, we'll be joined by singer Valerie Day and guitarist and songwriter John Smith. They're here to reveal the full story behind our 1980s hit transatlantic smash, I Can't Wait. I'm sitting on a wooden crate next to the furnace in our apartment. And I said, I want to write the funkiest thing I can think of. I scribbled out two verses at the kitchen table, threw them up in Val's face and said, what do you think? Oh, it's fine. You know, and that was, I can't wait. Some songs when you record them come alive. And then some songs that you think are going to be just incredibly great when they get recorded just kind of fall flat. And I Can't Wait was one of the first kind. It's like we had a child. That child went out into the world and is in a foreign country sending money home. And that's just a beautiful thing. Washington Park, the Aerial Tram, Pearl District, and Multnomah Falls. These are all landmarks of Portland, Oregon, a city of regional importance to the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. and home to over 2.5 million people in its metro area. It's a place widely known not only for its access to the great outdoors and fine wineries, but also for its peculiar culture and politics. You'd be surprised to know that Portland holds the highest number of strip clubs per capita in the entire country. Lots of man buns and mustaches, a vacuum museum, and even the world's smallest park. In the midst of this wonderfully weird setting, it's a thriving music scene that welcomes people involved in all kinds of musical expressions, from classical and jazz to hip hop, R&B, Riot Girl and Punk. Husband and wife duo Valerie Day and John Smith were a part of what they call the golden age of live music in Portland, playing up to five days a week for many years and incorporating diverse Latin jazz infused sounds into their stage show. And when it seemed that they were stuck in a rut, along came a funky beat born in their little apartment that turned their lives upside down. Many people, including musicians, remixers, DJs, and family members, contributed in making I Can't Wait an unsuspected global hit in the summer of 1986 and the signature tune of New Shoes. A music career, however, was the last thing on the mind of a young Portlander named Valerie Day. She does admit that as she was entering her teens, this would be a different story. My mother was a classical lyric soprano and a really good one. So I never thought I would be a singer. Her voice was world class and that was her thing. <laughs> so I was going to do something different. I did grow up singing though. Our family sang all together in performances um, and in the car and, you know, music was just a constant. So that was really lucky. And I also got to take piano lessons and things like that when I was growing up. But then in high school, well, actually, no, it was right around college age right around when I was 18, I got interested in Latin percussion. And that kind of took over my life for a good many years. And then singing uh, came, came into it. Over 960 miles away in Los Angeles, California, a 19-year-old John Smith decided on a whim to go out on an adventure that almost reads as a script straight from a Hollywood movie. His spur of the moment that Valentine's Day morning in 1975 led him to meet the girl of his dreams in a Portland hippie commune. (laughs) 
I woke up one morning in Los Angeles in February, and it was gray, and I thought, I'm bored. I'm going to go see this high school girlfriend up at Evergreen State in Washington, in Olympia, Washington. And at 19, I mean, I was so dumb. <laughs> I look back, I'm like, you know, this was all dumb luck, really. So I I made it to Olympia, Washington. I was picked up by the equipment truck of the Bachman Turner Overdrive, you know, taking care of business, that band. And I've been taking care of business every day, taking care of business every way. Uh, and they, they took me all the way up to Olympia. Uh, can I just and... interject one little point here? Yeah. It was February. And it was it was February in LA. That's a different kind of environment than in Olympia, Washington, where yeah. it's a lot colder <laughs> and rainier and wetter. And I think he just had five dollars. Three. Three. Three dollars. And he didn't really realize that you could get to Olympia faster if you took I five. So he had checked up one oh one, which is the coast route up the west coast, which is a lot windier. <laughs> And slower. <laughs> and slower. <laughs> and so anyway, there you go. There, that sets the scene a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I get to the girlfriend's uh, dorm and she looks at me like, what the hell are you doing here? So I took a shower, spent the night and left the next day. Met a guy on the freeway that shared his uh, thermos full of Irish coffee with me. And he said, you know, there's this hippie commune in Portland where uh, if you do the dishes, you can have have dinner and crash there for the night. You seem like a decent guy. And so we went there and it was this hippie commune called the First Cosmic Bank of Divine Economy, which divine economy, first of all, is uh, you get out what you put in. <laughs> and it was called the Cosmic Bank for short. It's run by this ex-school teacher. Well, and it was there was my fifth just... grade teacher, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And so Valerie and I actually met the first day. She thought I'd look dumb and I thought she was 12. <laughs> so I so it took 15. us about a, it took us about a month to get together. That's the edited version. <laughs> I had a really rough time trying to find a smart girlfriend in LA. Nothing against LA, I love growing up there, but I never found a smart girlfriend. So when I met Valerie, it was like, oh my God, a smart girlfriend who also probably ticked off all the boxes physically too. And we both were interested actually in the same sorts of, same kinds of music. We, we had our, just like, you know, in art, I like modern art, and he likes ancient art, <laughs> basically, 15th century stuff. But we both liked this one band called Mahavishnu Orchestra with a guitar player named John McLaughlin. That was kind of amazing because that was not a normal, usual pop radio kind of thing to be interested in and so I don't know it was just weird it was a very slow burn it wasn't like we met each other and we're like the rockets went off and there was great <laughs> great attraction it was it was more like wow you're kind of interesting and the more I got to know him the more interesting he became. Valerie and John didn't start playing together until a few years later when they immersed themselves in a melange of ethnic sounds like calypso and salsa that emanated from their very own local community. I just love jazz. And I guess in high school, I was listening to a lot of Joni Mitchell and other, you know, kind of more folk pop kinds of things. Singer-songwriters. Singer-songwriters, exactly. And then, I don't know, when did we discover Latin jazz, John? I, it's it's all... Felicidades. Yeah. I guess we had these friends who were in a band called Felicidades, and through them we just learned about all these different Latin bands. And John ended up being the piano player and doing arrangements for Felicidades. And, yeah, uh, I, I just have to interject here that um, yeah. Portland, for some reason, had this really thriving world music scene. Before it was called world music, but there was African bands and salsa bands. 
and kind of Latin jazz, you know, Stan Getz kind of bands. It was really a treasure. And, and later, for a minute, Portland had the best music scene in the world. But anyway, we fell in with this band, Felicidades, who played for the underage crowd. And we just kind of ended up being absorbed into this family. Not a real family, but, you know. Um, Community. A community, that's a better word. This community of Latin players. And around 1975, I got bit by the bug to be an arranger. There's enough guitar heroes, you know. And I really idolized this Japanese woman, Toshiko Akiyoshi, who had a big band. Akiyoshi Tobacco Big Band. And from that moment, I just wanted to have that big music paper in front of me and uh, score for stuff. It took a couple years to learn it. But once I got to Portland, almost everything I wrote got played by somebody, you know, and you could hear what worked and what didn't. So anyway, yeah, there was an amazing Latin scene for some reason <laughs> in Portland, and we fell into that. The Felicidades era was short-lived. While Valerie was studying with a professional percussionist and taking classes in college, John traveled to New York and realized he had enough of the Latin beats. While looking for a change in musical direction, he tapped into the horn-based soulful sound that served as a backdrop to his L.A. upbringing. When I was 11, I moved to Los Angeles and discovered the black AM radio station there, KGFJ. and got a real thorough background in soul music. But at the time, didn't think about, you know, starting a horn band or anything. <laughs> I didn't even play anything yet. But then, you know, you fast forward to 78, I'm like, okay, wow, all this soul music is neglected. You know, the soul era kind of ended in 1970 and people forgot about it. So I came back and I knew I wanted horns because Felicidades had horns. And once you have horns in your band, a horn section, you can't live without it, you know? So we didn't end up in the band together until 1980. The band started in 79 as a four piece. Originally, I wanted to do something like The Temptations, you know, a vocal group where the vocals was the big thing. And we limped along. Everybody in the band wanted to do something different. And so one day in 1980, I was rehearsing with a big band on Sundays, a rehearsal band. And I just plucked four horn players out of there and said, hey, you want to play soul music? And they did. And then it really started to go. And then in 1981, we got a ladies' night slot. Valerie was just done with a year of college. I said, hey, man. <laughs> the band's taken off. Why don't you come back and be in the real music business? And the rest is, as they say, the rest is mystery. We had a gig at the park right down the street from where we rehearsed. And we needed a name to put on the poster. So the co-founder of the band and myself we look over at the wallpaper and it's like this 1890s fish wrap kind of old newspaper print and there was some lace-up shoes and we thought oh shoes that's dumb we were in the era of dumb nouns like the cars and the police you know just one noun was the name it's sort of like now there's restaurants called fork <laughs> um <laughs> So we were the shoes for a couple gigs, and then we found in a record store a band called Shoes from Ohio. They're from Ohio. And the bass player said, why don't you be New Shoes? Okay. And spell it like this, N-U-S-H-O-O-Z, because it's more rock. That's what he said. And thus is the origin story of the band name. And I gotta say, I really disliked the band name for a long time, for like 30 years. It took me 30 years to like it because I wanted it to be something tough like Megadeth or Tower of Power, you know, mm. new shoes. But uh, eventually <laughs> I realized that it was perfectly appropriate for the dance music era. The band in its early stage was fronted by a male vocalist named David Muzzer, while Valerie provided backup. They started performing in various clubs four hours a night, 
between two to five days a week. But when the lead singer started missing out on gigs, Valerie took over as the main focus of the group. As she started to put more demand on her voice, she experienced a condition that is very common among professional singers, one that almost threatened to put a stop to new shoes. I developed nodules right away because I'd always been a natural singer, but I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea how the voice worked. And um, I went through a series of uh, different voice teachers who also didn't really know how the voice works. And I kept getting worse. And the doctor said, you have to quit singing for at least three months and let the nodules, which are little calluses on your vocal cords, uh, let them heal. And I knew that with 12 people in the band, there was no way. Actually, at that point, we had nine people. Anyway, I knew with nine people in the band, there was there was no way I could take three months off. They'd either replace me or the band would fall apart. So I found a voice teacher and I started taking lessons and he was really fantastic. And he saved my voice. I was able to keep singing. I would tear my voice apart during the week and we put it back together at my lesson. I learned how to take care of it every day. And then it takes about a year and a half to two years for the vocal fold tissue to rehabilitate. And so at about a year and a half, the vocal nodules came off and my voice became clear again. And that was just in time because we had we got our record deal right around that time. <music> There were so many other things happening in town. There were some amazing bands like Pleasure and Kular and some funk Johnny bands. And the Distractions. Yeah, some funk bands, some rock bands. Uh, again, the Dan world, Reed. the world music scene. There was a lot going on. It it really was an incredible time, partly because the downtown bar scene was really incredible, and so it supported the music scene because there were places to play that weren't every people. week. Every week you could be playing somewhere in in downtown Portland or on you know in the suburbs, and it was also still a cheap city to live in so it was easier to be a musician there than a lot of other places we kept trying to go to LA and you know make forays into some of these music cities and you had to pay to play even back then and so we would always come back to Portland and go well why should we do that <laughs> we, yeah you know, it was cheesy compared to Portland I'm yeah. telling you Portland for about six years maybe was the best music city in the world it for was playing. there was ten, there for was people, for playing yeah but if like, you wanted to be in the music clubs. but if you wanted to be in the music business la and new york and nashville and these other cities were still where it was happening because that's where sure. the infrastructure is for the music business and we didn't realize that part we didn't know anything <laughs> about the music business oh, we no. thought it was all about music <laughs> we didn't know there was this <laughs> Well, but because it was before the internet, it was also before some of the some of the, book, some of the books that came out after we had gotten our record deal. We were like, oh, dang! Wished we could have read this book before we got our record deal, so we would have yeah, known we more. Were dumb. Um, we were ignorant of what the real world was like, but we were very fortunate in that we got to play a ton, and that was a really great experience and one that I feel like. Musicians sometimes don't get these days because there's not as many places to play and they don't get to play in front of live audiences, especially right now, but they don't get to play <laughs> in front of live audiences on a regular basis and really hone their craft. For a while before they secured their record deal, New Shoes was one of Portland's top live bands and a revolving door of local musicians that shared the same passion for music as Valerie and John, who by Valentine's Day 1982 had officially tied the knot. The 12-piece band slimmed down to nine and then to just a few core members, which included their manager, Rick Warritz. After grueling tour schedules and simmering musical differences, strained a once unified front. We've had 70 people go through the band, but if you make that, you know, 14 years, 70 people in 14 years, it pencils out to six or seven people a year. But there was a few core people, our bass player and our trumpet player mainly stayed with us. And we had a manager, Rick Waritz, who started in 82 and guided us through our album making era and all that. His first foray into the music business was he used to book jazz acts for a jazz club. And so he saw 
the nine piece new shoes which was really one of the great versions of the band there were seven versions of the band and he saw something in us and just uh grabbed the reins and took over so having rick aggressively managing was really a good deal but we were kind of a triumvirate a holy trinity uh um, at the top holy, of but <laughs> anyway well, yeah yeah but there were three <laughs> a trinity okay okay there you go and the band members were just happy to be part of something that was up and running you know that was roaring because those i don't know my favorite era really was before we got signed in terms of having fun playing music exhausted by all these personnel changes and covering other people's songs on stage john became more inclined than ever to write original material for the band and fill dance floors in the process on a cold winter day in december of 1983 he sat down with a rented four track machine and started work on a song that would do just that. Although the journey from its original version to the one people know and love was a long one. I'm sitting on a wooden crate next to the furnace in our apartment. And I said, I want to write the funkiest thing I can think of. And that started with the bass line, which was uh, you drop the low string down to D for all you techno uh, musician people. And then it took a long time to fool with it. I walked around the blocks for days and days and maybe a month with the demo track on a Sony Walkman. And it just sort of came together, but there were no verses yet. So it's almost done. I, I got the chorus figured out. It's gonna work really good. And we didn't have verses yet. So we rehearsed in our apartment, our whole, uh, I think we were down to seven people by then. And we rehearsed every Wednesday in the basement of our apartment. And so 15 minutes before rehearsal, when the band's loading in the gear, I scribbled out two verses at the kitchen table, threw them up in Val's face and said, what do you think? Oh, it's fine, you know? And that was, I can't wait, which, then then we proceeded to play way too fast for about a year and then i just took another look at it and went oh i think it should be. It, we were playing it like dun, 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 you know and i went in the studio and went no it should be which is uh a kick snare pattern from grandmaster flash I get in the studio and no one has told me that the track has been slowed way down. And I couldn't sing it. I had, I had a terrible time. I was so frustrated because I just felt it fast because we'd been playing it fast forever and since its inception. And now I had to sink into this slower vibe and I just felt like I couldn't do it. But we didn't, you know, have a lot of studio, have a lot of money to spend on studio time. So I ended up doing it. And then the song still kind of laid there. Some songs when you record them come alive and then some songs that you think are going to be just incredibly great when they get recorded just kind of fall flat and I can't wait was one of the first kind that it was just kind of sitting around until the um the bottles so we fooled with this song for six months not every day, obviously, because we'd have to go out and make money to pay our studio bill. But six months later, after the first tracks were put down, I'm on my way to the studio and I put on Jungle Love by the time. And I heard these bottles and stereo tambourines playing different parts. And we went in, got some bottles, drank the wine in them, and then the song came alive. It really started to chug along. The other people that worked on this, everybody who worked on this contributed to it. I cannot claim that I Can't Wait was my achievement alone. Our manager decided that he would hire the bass player from a band called Pleasure, 
famous Portland funk band from the 70s. He hired the bass player from Pleasure, who brought in a mini Moog and dialed in the sound, which I never could have gotten. I did write the bass line, but it was played by one of the greatest bass players in America. Nick and uh, then the engineer producer was this guy named Fritz Richmond, who was a friend of Bob Dylan's. And he had turned down mixing the Woodstock album because he didn't feel qualified enough. And we didn't even know what a legend this guy was. He was so he was humble. The, he was, yeah, he, he never talked about himself or any of the projects that ever. he did. And he was we the found guy. Out later. Yeah, we found out later that he was also the person who sort of made granny glasses a thing back in the '60s. Yeah, um, he basically invented them. <laughs> Fritz was the was the guy who was engineering the record, and when it was done, he said, "Is this going to be a single?" And we were like, "What's a single?" Because <laughs> we didn't even know really what a radio single was, and so he shepherded us through creating a single that was the right length had the right amount of intro in it and without fritz it also would not have been the record that it was hey baby Valerie and John worked hard during most of 1984 to put down a slower, groovier version of I Can't Wait, recorded with four other songs for an EP called That's Right, co-produced by John, manager Rick Waritz, and Fritz Richmond. The studio budget was tight for the struggling couple, so some Italian benefactors came in to help. We didn't have any money. So someone actually, some friends of my mom's, who I didn't even realize that they'd done this, they gave us $2,500. And that was what we had to make this five song EP. They didn't give us the money. They actually loaned it to us. Um, but I think they probably figured they'd never get the money back. <laughs> so well, good it, on the, it's a <laughs> little, were... little bit different. Correction. Okay. Um, our manager, Rick, his aunt died, and he inherited five thousand dollars, and that was the original thing. And then, oh, the I babblers. I don't remember that part. That's the so babblers weird. lent us twenty five hundred dollars to complete it. Wow! So the whole thing cost seven thousand five hundred dollars. Yeah, which was a huge amount of money. Oh my god! For, yeah, I mean, we barely made I don't know two hundred bucks a week together at that point or something. <laughs> I mean, it was just. Yeah, it was a, an astronomical amount of money. So we have this five song EP and we put it out and a local music writer for the Downtowner in Portland, Oregon, writes that it's a great EP and it's too bad that local radio like C100 won't play local acts. And the Z100 Morning Zoo got a hold of that article and read it over the air one morning. Our manager, Rick, was awake and he jumped on his Vespa with the cassette because they had actually called us out and said, hey, New Shoes, if you're listening, bring that cassette on down and we'll play a cut from it. So Rick jumps on his Vespa, takes the cassette to the station. They pick I Can't Wait and the phones lit up. People loved it. And I think that's actually, we found out many, many years later that uh, Gary Bryant, the DJ from that Morning Zoo show, was hellbent on breaking an act from Portland. It was the strongest song, and it also had the most room for my vocal, I have to say. I mean, <laughs> the, the way it was put together, it's like clockwork, you know? There's all these parts of it that fit into each other. There's a call and response thing that happens in the song. And I just think there was room for the vocal to come through, and it was the right moment for the song. Spoken like a true vocalist. I know, right? <laughs> to speak for vocalists everywhere. With the push from the major radio stations in the Pacific Northwestern region, I Can't Wait became an instant top 10 hit. However, it did not get any attention from the record labels, at least not yet. We went to all the major record labels in the country to say, we've got a hit, sign us. And they all said, no, we actually got a demo deal with Warner Brothers. And we went down to LA and we recorded about, what, three to five songs, I think, with them. And they said, sorry, we've already got Madonna. You sound like too much like her, which is so weird because I don't sound like Madonna. But anyway... 
So then we didn't know what to do. This record was a smash around the Pacific Northwest, but we just couldn't get any love from the major labels. And that's when this DJ subscription record called Hot Tracks got in touch with us and said, can we put, I can't wait on this subscription record that goes out to DJs all across the country. And we said, sure, nothing else is going on. That record made it over to Holland where it was picked up by Injection Records who hired Peter Slockhouse to do a remix. And that remix made its way back to New York, to the dance clubs there, where it was found by the Atlantic Dance Department. And that's how we got a record deal, because the record was going crazy in the dance clubs in New York. And the DJ who pushed it in New York was Larry Levan, legendary DJ at the Paradise Garage. There was three great dance clubs in New York, the Palladium, the Paradise Garage, and the Roseland. And Larry Levan just pushed that record on the dance floor. And of course, people went nuts for it. The uh, beginning is obvious that he added that synth line. Da, 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 da. That's basically what he did. He really didn't like the song. We found out 35 years later that Peter Slockhouse didn't really like that song. He was more into ABBA and New Shoes is nothing like that. So uh, he added that and then he did some breakdowns and added things like broken glass in the long version. A lot of crazy stuff that he did in the middle and some really nice tape cutting. This was back in the days when you did a remix by cutting tape with a razor blade. And so he's a master at razor blading stuff. So I, I, I can't wait. He did that. I got to watch him in action cutting tape and it was really, really something. Learned a couple tricks. Portlanders were so behind us. It was like the home team had won the playoffs or something. And because it was hardly, you ever, you always heard about these, you know, bands from LA or New York or some of the bigger cities making it and to have a Portland band in the big time was, was huge. So we felt incredibly supported and loved and it was really fun. It was the so-called Dutch mix of I Can't Wait, included on their gold-certified Atlantic debut LP Poolside, that turned new shoes from a regional act into a nationwide known band. The song soared all the way to number three on Billboard's Hot 100 and remained at the top 40 for 15 weeks. It reached the top of the summit of the dance club charts in the country and peaked at number two on R&B. I Can't Wait was an even bigger hit overseas, reaching the top 10 in Canada, the UK, Ireland, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, New Zealand, and Switzerland. New Shoes earned a Grammy nomination in 1987 as Best New Artist, but lost to Bruce Hornsby and The Range. That same year, they released one more album with Atlantic called Told You So that featured the single Should I Say Yes, which almost scratched the U.S. top 40. Both John and Valerie agreed that the variety of influences that New Shoes possessed proved challenging for Atlantic Records to navigate. The label therefore struggled to position the band after the crossover success of I Can't Wait. I want to say, to Atlantic Records' credit, they did not mess with us very much. They rode this single, that, you know, it was went to number three on the top 100 and number one dance. And so they saw that. And so I think six months later, nine months later, they asked us to deliver a record, a whole album. But they didn't really know what the hell they were signing because we were jazz people. We didn't even know about the dance club scene or anything. We were just jazz kind of bebop people doing Tower of Power and our own stuff that hopefully sounded like Tower of Power. 
But Atlantic, the dance department, you know, they're just interested in dance stuff. And we were this kind of hippie jazz band. So I don't know. I think Atlantic was baffled by us. And eventually, here's what happens at record labels is that you get signed. By the time your second record comes out, the people that signed you are gone. They move on to other jobs. So by the time our second record came out, a lot of the people that signed us were gone and we got thrown into the R&B department where they didn't really dig us that much. But it's okay because they didn't mess with us at all until the end. Because we were such a mashup of different things. You know, you listen to New Shoes and there's all these weird influences from Little Feet to R&B to soul music to, to Shigo Akiyoshi Big Band to Coltrane to, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just this weird mashups. And we didn't really have anybody at the label who understood that. We had like, I think, three or four different A&R people. Yeah. And, um, the last one was great. And he got fired <laughs> immediately. He, well, he was a musician, so he could come in and he could listen to the stuff and he could talk in music language to us about maybe what to change and what to do differently. But I don't um, think that chord works there. Do you? Yeah. You know, it was really nice, really nice to finally but have then, someone that understood that. But then he got fired. So my takeaway from the whole experience is that it's all about relationships. These days, it, it's a whole different scene, but it still is about relationships. Even though the music business has changed, humans haven't that much. So I think it's important to, to not use people, not use relationships, but to figure out who really is on your side and who can fight for you and who understands what you're doing. And then your responsibility is to be able to communicate that. And we didn't really know how to communicate either. You know, we didn't know how to communicate who we were, what we wanted to do, what our vision was for the band. Um, what image we wanted. Yeah, any of those things. So if you have those things together, you're going to have a much easier time getting what you want artistically. And then hopefully it also helps keep the music alive so that you can keep making it and have a life doing it. I'd like to add one more thing. The great thing in our own lives about I Can't Wait is it enabled us to spend the rest of our lives as artists. It is major. Yeah. We got to make a lot more music and we got to do a lot of music on our terms, which is incredible. At Planet Records dropped new shoes from his roster in 1992. Two years after recording a third album with the label, Eat and Run, which was never released. Valerie and John took the next two decades to raise their son, Malcolm, and work on other endeavors. Valerie became an in-demand session percussionist, sang in jazz quartets and big bands, and taught voice, while John continued to write music, this time for indie films and commercials. The interest in making music together as new shoes was there in its purest form once again by the beginning of the new millennium. In 2007, the same year they were inducted into the Oregon Music Hall of Fame, they released a chamber jazz album as New Shoes Orchestra, entitled Pandora's Bots. New Shoes later revisited archival material on 2012's Kumpau Kitchen and explore its love for all things funk, soul, and R&B on their most recent studio project, 2016's Bagtown. In mid-2021, after spending seven years on the road as part of the 80s tour circuit, Valerie and John decided to hang up the shoes, quite literally and relish on the great legacy they leave behind. It felt like time to step away from these tours because we've had so many different kinds of musical adventures in our lives. And this last one, doing these 80s tours for seven years, was a blast. We had a great time with the fans who we got to interact with in ways we never had before because of social media and just, you know, all kinds of modern ways of communicating. 
we also got to hang out backstage with a bunch of the artists that we listened to and loved and got to know their stories and get to know them in a way that we never could back in the day because we were all so busy, you know, being on tour and sometimes not with each other. And after seven years, we just felt like, wow, that's been an amazing ride. It's time to move on and do something else. It's like the surf goes out and it's, you know, who knows, maybe it'll come back in again someday. But for now, it just feels like a really great time to do all the other artistic pursuits that we have uh, in the hopper. There's only so much that you can do with that kind of show. You know, there was no room to develop it further. And I think we both reached that conclusion. It wasn't a hard decision. It was the obvious decision. Valerie and I come at life from two different angles. You know, she likes modern art. I like 15th century art, you know, but we go to a museum and we always like the same thing. (laughs) Go figure, you know. And so uh, this was very easy. It just seemed like the time to do it. Like the same way we decided it was time to move to a different city and just have a different experience. I'm so grateful for our situation in that we can make that decision. Um, One of the things that we did right, and we did a lot of things wrong, but one of the things oh, yeah. one of the things we did right was we kept our publishing. And so since John uh, wrote most of the, the songs that we ever recorded, in fact, all of the songs we recorded, with the exception of me helping him on a few, and anyway, we own the rights to the publishing. And that makes it possible for us to step away from doing live performing, which a lot of our compatriots and a lot of the musicians we know don't have that luxury. So we're incredibly grateful that we have the opportunity. And Yeah, um, their songs were written by the producers, you know, so they don't have any mailbox money coming in. And touring is the only revenue stream for a lot of people, especially from the dance music era. Though the future of new shoes remains uncertain, Valerie and John are not vanishing from the face of the earth. Valerie is a fellow podcaster herself, hosting a show called Living a Vocal Life, where she interviews her friends in the music industry. John, on the other hand, still writes songs to this day, as well as graphic novels, which he sells on his website, malcocreative.com. As for I Can't Wait, It is still alive and kicking and gets played on the radio somewhere on this planet every 11 minutes. It continues to be embraced by newer generations, like on the 2010 track Buzzin' by Man featuring 50 Cent, proof of the legendary hit staying power and the miracle of both music and timing. A hit song is a combination of the song the singer, the vocal performance, the gear it was recorded on, and what's going on in the business at any given time. And so the door was just open, the ecosystem was right, everything came together to make an international hit that we couldn't have done by ourselves. You know, it took a lot of people. And you write a song, you never know what song's gonna be a hit. Ask anybody if a song's gonna be a hit, you don't know, because it's just these sort of atomic factors coming together, atoms coalescing. Some things become a supernova and some things become a black hole. I mean, it's just amazing. I, some of my favorite stories, though, are people who, who get in touch with us. Um, for instance, when 50 Cent and Man used I Can't Wait as the bed for Buzzin', people would call us up and say, oh, my kids are in the car and they're slamming to Buzzin'. And, and I'm like, well, you don't even know where that song came from. Let me play you the original. (laughs) And they play their kids the original, and then they love it too. Mom, that sucks. (laughs) (laughs) That's not what I heard. But anyway, um, (laughs) it's magic. It's just, it's a miracle. That's all. That's all it is. I don't even know. Yeah, it's a miracle. We had nothing to do with it. It's like we had a child. That child went out out into the world and is in a foreign country sending money home. Uh, And that's just a beautiful thing. Thank you so much to Valerie Day and John Smith for their valuable contributions to this episode. And thanks to all of you for listening. 
This episode was produced and hosted by yours truly, Diego Martinez. Our executive producer is Nicholas Nick Fresh Buzo, and our audio engineer is Adam Fogel. Follow Tunes all over social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TunesPod. That is C-H-O-O-N-S-P-O-D. And become a part of our community on Patreon, where you can find early access to our content, after-show discussions, and much more, starting at $5 per month. Go to patreon.com slash tunespod. Don't forget to rate us and give us a review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. We'll be back with more explorations on the songs that form the soundtrack to our lives on the next installment of Tunes. Thank you.